Welcome to Structural Shifts by Aperture, a bi-weekly show that radically reimagines the future of work, society, and business. We take a devil's advocate approach to exploring the massive shifts transforming our economies and our world, and our guests are not afraid to challenge the status quo. To learn more about Aperture, visit Aperture.co. Have you noticed that major developed economies are investing more in intangible assets like design and branding than they are in tangible assets like buildings and machinery? Well, today's guest, Steen Westlake, examines this quiet revolution in a book that he co-authored titled Capitalism Without Capital, The Rise of the Intangible Economy. In today's episode, your host, Ben Robinson, sits down with Steen to discuss the four S's that explain how intangible assets behave differently than tangible ones, why why we're not seeing more economic growth or higher productivity right now, even though intangible assets are more scalable, what governments need to do to mitigate the increased income inequality that's occurring in part due to the rise of intangible investment, and more. Steen serves as the chief executive of the Royal Statistical Society. Previously, he served as advisor to three British ministers for science, innovation, research, and higher education. He also led the policy and research team at Nesta, which is the UK's National Foundation for Innovation. Enjoy the show. Steen, thank you so much for coming on the Structural Shifts podcast. We're really delighted to have you on. I think there are a few structural shifts as profound as the one you've been investigating, most notably through your 2018 book, Capitalism Without Capital, uh, which is the shift from a tangible to an intangible economy. This is a phenomenon which has been playing out over the last 40 years in developed economies and which, as we'll discuss, has likely been accelerated by the pandemic. It's also a phenomenon which, although it might seem slightly esoteric, is at the root of or contributing to some of the biggest changes we see in society, such as inequality, as well as in business, such as the rise of big tech platforms. So if it's okay with you, let's start by just defining what we mean by an intangible economy. So do you mind just kind of setting the scene and telling us to the, the extent to which investment has shifted from tangible to intangible assets. Yeah, of course. If we think about what the economy used to be like 40, 50, 100 years ago, the majority of the stuff that businesses, that governments invested in was stuff you could see and touch, what economists would call tangible capital. So it was machines, it was factories, it was vehicles, it was buildings, all these kind of things. One of the things that we've been noticing is there has been a really slow but pronounced change over time, such that now, The majority of investments that businesses make, by an investment, I mean something that you incur a cost upfront and that delivers you a benefit over time. Most of the stuff is stuff that you can't see or touch, things that you can't stub your toe on, as it were. It's things like investing in R&D to create new ideas, new patents, things like investing in marketing, advertising, customer understanding to build brands. It's things like employer training. And it's stuff that has this kind of fuzzy idea of things like organizational development. So if you think of a company like Apple, one of Apple's competitive advantages is their remarkable supply chain. Now, the supply chain includes some things that you can touch, it includes factories, but Apple don't own those. And those are to some extent fungible. The stuff that really creates value for Apple is these privileged relationships, the expectation of doing business, and their access to these suppliers, which allows them, for example, to get products to market at volume fast. These things are investments. They're costly to acquire, and they deliver benefits over time, but they're very different from the world where your investments were the machines in the factory or the land that you grazed your cattle on. The book is full of brilliant graphics but one of the ones that sort of really stands out is the one that shows that that you know the sort of acceleration in investment in intangibles and the point at which it crosses over so intangibles now represent or comprise a larger uh, proportion of overall business assets than tangible assets yeah that's right so if you think of these as a percentage of gdp so in relation to the size of the economy for most of history, tangible assets represented a much bigger slug of the economy that investment than intangible assets and about 10 to 20 years ago, depending on the country, those two lines cross. The intangible line has been moving up and up and up, slowly but steadily for decades. They crossed. If you look in rich countries now, intangible investment represents yeah, roughly 15% of GDP of national annual output and tangible asset more like 10, 11%. That crossing, one of the nice things about these kind of slow but steady changes is – 
you could be pretty confident that these things are, are, are reliable. We have so much data on this. This is a change that's been going on for a very long time. You say um, we can be, you know, we can be confident in the reliability of the data, but I mean, you used the term fuzzy for some of these intangible assets earlier on, and that sort of suggests that there might be things that are quite difficult to define and therefore quite difficult to, to value and capture on a balance sheet or in, in economic statistics, GDP statistics. So it's a really good question. And it's one of these things that has traditionally, they've traditionally not been very well captured in either economic statistics, the kind of thing that governments put together, or in business statistics, the kind of thing that your accountants will put together. And one of the one of the kind of interesting parts of this 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 work, my co-author Jonathan Haskell, along with many other economists, have really spent a lot of the last 20 years trying to work out ways of measuring this intangible investment at the level of the economy. And they've used surveys, they've used fascinating historical data sets. It took quite a while to get a handle on this stuff, but the results are pretty conclusive that this intangible investment is growing. Where things get tricky, you mention company accounts. Some, you know, sometimes there are things that are very easy to measure at the big picture, but they get harder to measure the more granular you get. And intangible investment is definitely, definitely one of those things. In that national accounts do a kind of okay job of representing this. Nowadays, most countries will record their R and D investment. They'll record some of their kind of human capital investments, but. Corporate accounting standards don't recognize this stuff. So you will find very few intangible assets on a balance sheet. And I guess one of the interesting aspects of this is if you look at the job of people who try and value businesses with a lot of intangible assets, so sell-side investment analysts, people who work for hedge funds or other investment funds, it's really interesting. There was a whole bunch of research done on what these guys spend their time doing when they're on CEO calls, CFO calls, and someone managed to code all these conversations. It turns out that most of these things are actually asking about intangible assets to try and understand the value of whether it's supply chains, whether it's the R&D going into the new product line. And there's a kind of an interesting opportunity here if you're involved in investment because this stuff is 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 harder to value and if stuff is harder to value that's good for the people whose expertise lies in valuation it's true i, I never you know i suppose i had thought about it but not in that not, not like that exactly which is it's kind of an arbitrage opportunity isn't it because i suppose superficially things like uh, return on capital might be might be understated or profits might be uh, understated because so much of this stuff should be on the balance sheet, but it's, but is expensed through the P and L, and then and then you know j- just having a sort of d- better understanding of the things that are not recorded in annual accounts or in you know in the annual report gives you potentially gives you an edge. Right? Yeah, and I guess you know if you think about the way things have always worked in say on the sell side when you look at sectors like pharma. So pharma is a sector that has always been heavily based on intangible assets. The value of GSK is kind of the value of its pipeline of 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 drug ideas. And I guess if you're an analyst in that sector, what you've always done is basically you've done a bunch of valuations of the product of what you know to be the product pipeline with some kind of option value based on what you think the innovative capability of the firm is. And I guess in a world, an intangible, uh, sorry, in an economy where intangible capital gets more and more important, more of the task of investment analysis is going to look more like being a farmer investment analysis uh, analyst or even a kind of an analyst at a VC house. Definitely. You talk about um, the four S's of intangible assets. Do, do, do you mind just running us through this? Because I think it's really critical that we understand the sort of properties of intangible assets. And you know, since they behave differently, uh, that then in turn means that economies behave differently and so on. So do, do you mind just telling us about the four S's? Yeah, totally. If you take away only one thing from the book, this is the thing to take away from it. So the reason why we should care about the change to intangible capital is that from an economic point of view, intangible capital behaves differently. And the four S's are the kind of four ways in which it acts differently. The four S's are scale, scalability, sunkenness, spillovers, and synergies. I'll just quickly give an example of what, what I mean by each of those. So scalability, if you compare an intangible asset to a tangible asset, a tangible asset, you can only get a certain amount of use of before you need to kind of invest, you need to invest in more of those tangible assets. If you own a kind of fleet of taxis, if you want to carry more than a certain number of customers, you need to buy or lease more taxis. If what you own is an algorithm for dispatching private hire cars like Uber, that is kind of, you can scale that, if not infinitely, then arbitrarily. You can scale that across a very large number of taxis in a very large number of cities. So valuable intangibles go a really long way. And one of the thing, implications that means that we can go on to talk about is that 
Um, if you're a big company with some valuable intangibles, you can get very big. You can create a, you can create a lot of value. The second S we talked about sunkenness. So sunkenness, this kind of refers to the economist's idea of sunk costs, the fact that sometimes once you've invested in something, you can't recover the value of it. And that's very much more true for intangible assets than tangible assets. So if you own, for example, an office building, a tangible asset, and you go out of business, you can very often sell that office building. You can recover quite a lot of the value from it, even if you're in a distressed sale. If you own a patent, you can sell patents, but patents are very often worth almost nothing to anyone apart from a small number of providers. A brand of a company that's gone bust is, 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 is not worth a lot. And as we can maybe come to talk on later, that's got some really important implications for how you finance businesses that have a lot of intangible assets, because debt investors do not like some costs. The third S is spillovers. And the idea of a spillover is with intangible assets have a lot of spillovers, and that means that a company that makes them can't always be sure that it will get most or even any of the benefits of an investment that it makes. So kind of classic, there are classic examples all through the history of tech, but Xerox Park, kind of one of the foundational stories of Silicon Valley, they invest, invented almost every kind of foundational computing technology, uh, the, the desktop computing technology you think of, they made no money from it. Most of the value was captured either by Apple, by Microsoft, or by a host of other companies. That is, it's much harder to control those spillovers than it is with tangible assets, where we've got a set of very clear rules around them. They're kind of physical, they're kind of easier to keep tabs on. And so managing those spillovers becomes a really important part of what successfully managing a business looks like in an intangible economy. And then the fourth thing, synergies, is this idea that intangible assets seem to be especially valuable when you combine them in the right way with other with other intangible assets. So a classic example that we talk about in the book is the EpiPen, the epinephrine injector for, 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 for stopping allergic reactions and anaphylactic shock. And what we talk about in the book is how that isn't really a sort of typical pharmaceutical invention. In fact, it's based on a drug with a patent that expired over 100 years ago. But one of the things that, that EpiPen's owners have very effectively done is they've combined a whole bunch of intangible assets from the design of the injector to their kind of very privileged supply chains, to the various legal moats that they put around things, to even the brand name, the recognizable brand name of a product that you kind of want to be able to recognize and describe in an emergency. And that together, all of those things, all of which are kind of intangible assets, combine to create a big competitive moat around the product, but ultimately kind of very profitable, very value creating product for them. Um, and these synergies exist, you know, between talent and intangibles, between different intangibles. And again, it means that if you're a company that has a bunch of these valuable intangibles, you can you can create a lot of value for shareholders. Fantastic. So I think. The four S's give us a really nice framework, to, I think, to dig into some of these other topics, right? So I wanted to move next to growth. So you talk about the scalability of intangible assets, right? So you know, if the economy is made up of more intangible assets and those intangible assets are more scalable, why don't we see more economic growth or, 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 you know, or higher productivity growth than we do at present? So it's so so that's a really good question. It's something that really ever since we started working about this, we've been we've been wrestling with, and it's a big subject of our follow up book, which is coming out later this year. But I guess one of the one of the things here is that there is a lot of productivity growth at the moment. It's just not evenly distributed. So if you run one of these companies that can benefit from the synergies and the scale of intangibles, i.e. you own a bunch of valuable intangibles, you can scale them across a really big business, and you can combine them in ways that kind of make it very difficult to, to, to compete with you. Those businesses, as far as we can see, are very profitable. Their profitability is growing. They make a lot of money for their shareholders and their employees. And they're kind of seen as iconic businesses. So, you know, your classic dominant internet platforms, Google, and Facebook, and whoever would be examples of that. But, you know, we see this in other areas as well. So, uh, you know, Domino's Pizza, classic example of a business that looks very old fashioned, but has totally killed it in terms of developing a very, very powerful internet platform. So I guess you, you, so you have a world where some businesses, because of intangibles, are doing really well. And one thing that we've been looking at is the fact that in an economy like that, because of these spillovers, you create a kind of perverse incentive for the rest of businesses. If intangibles have quite high spillovers, and if some firms are really good at getting the benefit of those spillovers, 
the rationale for investing for your kind of laggard businesses, your runners up in industries is plausibly much less. You know, if you're in a traditional, if you imagine a very tangible based economy, like an industry like, I don't know, running a laundrette, let's suppose the best laundrette has the best washing machines and the best, the best building. If you run the kind of second best or the third best laundrette, you can catch up in due course. You can borrow money from the bank. You can buy better machines. It's kind of pretty obvious what you need to do to catch up because you can visit the other business and look at what they're doing. There you see, you would expect to see over time that the great the gap between the most productive and most profitable businesses and the, the least would shrink because you can just copy. Now, if you're in an intangible economy, those dynamics change. Let, imagine you want to compete with Uber. Okay, you can try and develop your own dispatching app, but the scale effects are such that you're going to be you're going to be up against vast fixed costs. It's very unlikely you're going to be able to compete with the huge amount of money that Uber can pour into their development. And because of scale, you won't be able to kind of amortize that across a large business. Okay, so you say, okay, well, I'll come up with some new product feature that Uber hasn't come up with. Let's suppose you're an absolute, you know product development genius, and you come up with something. In this economy, because of the synergies and because of the spillovers that we talked about, you might not be very well advised to do that because Uber could quite simply copy it. Or you know they might buy you, which would be kind of a good story for you. But in terms of the, 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 the dynamic, your business goes away and the, the, the leader business grows more powerful. So rather than the world of laundrettes, where catching up with the leader is kind of about copying, it's about acquiring probably mass-produced cap fixed uh, the, the tangible capital that you can probably get a bank loan for. In the intangible economy, it's much harder to, to catch up like that. And I guess this comes back to your original question about, well, what might be going wrong with productivity? If you can imagine an economy where the best businesses are doing really well, are generating a lot of money for their shareholders, are being really productive, but there's a huge disincentive for, the, for a large chunk of the economy to invest and to catch up. In aggregate, that could come to an economy where productivity growth is actually is actually pretty slow. And in terms of the evidence for this, if we there's been a ton of research over the last kind of 20 years now looking at that gap between your so-called leader firms and laggard firms. And basically in every country and in every industry, that gap is growing. And really interestingly, it's growing the most in the industries that have the greatest number of intang- or the greatest proportion of intangible assets. Do you think there's another thing at play as well, which is in the world of tangible assets, economies of scale were were eventually subject to to diminishing ret- returns, right? Whereas in in the in the world of intangible assets, you know, where we have network effects, you could argue that a lot of times you get just increasing returns to scale. You know, you know, you talked about Uber. You know, I guess the more customers you have, the more drivers you can attract, the more drivers, the more customers, so and you get these kind of virtuous, self fulfilling, or you know, or feedback loops, right? That just sort of mean that you get increasing returns to scale, whereas in the past that was a very, almost wasn't possible in you know in economic terms. Right? Yeah, that's definitely true. And I think those network effects you talk about are a really important part of this kind of scalability of, of, of intangible assets. Do you think we should be using more antitrust? You know, so you talked about Facebook, right? And, I, and w- when I think about Facebook, I think, you know, the initial platform was super successful. Um, you know, it had very strong network effects. It, it delivered a lot of kind of you know, of of utility to its to its customers, but since then, you know, it's it's copied features from other people like Snapchat. It bought Instagram, and I just wonder, you know, should we be using antitrust to stop the big platforms from getting even bigger through you know through copying and and M and A, for example? Antitrust and competition policy clearly become very important in an era of intangible assets because of this kind of tendency of the best companies to do really well. The flip side is, I think a lot of the old rules become a lot harder to apply. So traditionally, we'd look at an economy and we'd look at an industry and we'd say, if the kind of concentration ratios are above a certain level, then um, that's a problem. And we need to break up the the, the leader firm or we need to block block acquisitions. That becomes a lot harder in this kind of economy, I think, for two reasons. Firstly, because these synergies, because there are so many crossovers between different types of asset, it becomes a lot harder to define an industry. So, for example, you know, what are Facebook and Google in the same industry? I mean, on one level, they're clearly not. One is a search engine, one is a social media site. But, you know, if you're an advertiser, they might look a lot like they're in the same industry. Or, you know, so it becomes a lot harder to make those distinctions. I think the other thing is that, you know, the kind of silver lining of scalability and spillovers is that although businesses can thrive and grow and kind of 
that their dominance can get entrenched. The flip side is when things go wrong, they collapse very quickly and new rivals can grow up very fast. So the kind of optimistic vision of competition in a world of intangibles probably looks a lot less like, it doesn't look like a market where there's kind of, you know, seven or 17 or 70 competitors all in the same market. It might be a market where you have people who temporarily look a lot like very dominant, almost monopolistic players, but where there's a lot of competition almost across industries and where you have enough dynamism, enough opportunities for startups that people like Facebook and Google will occasionally get dethroned. No, no, I agree with that. I think there's not enough sort of documentation of negative network effects because, you know, on the way up, it's, it's exponential potentially. On the way down, it can be exponential too. Are you saying that competitive or antitrust policy is difficult to execute, therefore, you know, we shouldn't try? Or are you just saying that we need to find new sort of yardsticks for anti-competitive behavior? Because similarly, you know, it's difficult to look at concentration. It's also difficult to look at price, right? Because so often these platforms lead to lower prices yeah. because they're monetized in, indirectly, right? So so I um, think I think it's a really good... So I think the short answer is it's probably the latter of your two things. It's more that we need to kind of come up with new ways of analyzing this, new ways of, of looking at it. And that's really tricky because one of the kind of nice things about the world of 20 years ago, if you were a competition regulator, your job, I don't want to say it's easy, it was a difficult job, but it was a it was quite rules-based. You know, there were ratios and there was a kind of whole... You know, there was a whole academic infrastructure of how you would think about the concentration ratio in a particular sector, although a lot of judgment needed to be applied to that. There was kind of some yardsticks. I think if you're if you're looking at this kind of thing now, it becomes much harder. And in the same way earlier that we were saying that to be a sell side investment analyst, you need kind of skill becomes more important and the, the, the job becomes harder. I think that's also true if you're a competition regulator, which I guess where that takes you, if you're sort of saying, what does this mean for politics or for public policy, is a really unfashionable position. It basically means you need to spend more money on people who've been derided as bureaucrats and pencil pushers, more money on their kind of analytic ability and be more willing to to, to, to at least consider innovative approaches to how, how you do those kind of things. But it all becomes a bit less objective, doesn't it? Because in the same way that, you know, a sales side analyst, you could sort of test in advance their ability to sort of understand the company accounts, or, or you could test, you know, a civil servant's ability to, to understand, you know, a legal framework or, or, or similarly, you know, financial information. How do you, it's very difficult sort of, you know, ex ante to understand or to, to kind of determine how good people are going to be at those jobs, right? And yeah. to, how much to pay them and so on, right? Well, it becomes much more, it becomes much more judgment based. And I guess one of the things that we know from, there's, I think, a whole branch of kind of management science looking at this kind of thing, that if it, if it's harder to measure performance in these jobs and more discretionary and more judgment based, that typically leads to higher salaries and it, it's, it's a more costly it's a more costly process to run. But I was thinking in the world of antitrust, if decisions are taken more based on judgment, then I suppose they're more open to sort of legal challenge and so on. It all becomes a bit... Yeah, no, yeah. You, the, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think the thing, I mean, it's really interesting. We see that across the piece as a result of intangible. So it's not just, I mean, we can come on to talking about this a little bit later, but this is also an implication of spillovers, for example. You're, we are probably in a world where... One of the one of the issues of spillovers is businesses will invest less that is kind of socially optimal in stuff like R and D. If you're in a world where you want more R and D investment, but businesses won't do it, that probably means you need governments or research institutes to do it. Again, that's quite a judgment based process. Yeah. So you're yeah. sort of saying you've got to you've got to trust people people in positions of authority to do this kind of thing, which is particularly challenging in today's political circumstance. So that's a real dilemma here, I think. Do we need stronger IP protection? Because I guess that's, again, it's a double-edged sword, yeah. right? Which is, what's the right balance there, do you think? So I guess the what, the things we're trying to balance, the, the spillovers, of, the spillovers are in, of intangibles would suggest that you want kind of tough, clear IP rules, because you kind of want to make sure that the stronger your IP roles, the more rules, the more the incentive to own IP and to invest in it are. 
Now, the problem, the thing that complicates that is the synergies between intangibles. So if you take a kind of product like Spotify is a great example of something born of the synergies of intangibles, because you've got music rights, which are kind of a one intangible asset. You've got the software and the network and the customer insight that, that Spotify have. By combining those, they've created a really valuable product that you know many of us are very happy to use. Now, Certainly what people at Spotify have always told me is that if the music rights industry had their way, if they had tougher IP rules and kind of more political influence, that Spotify would never have been allowed to get off the ground. They would have been sued and out of existence in their first year or two. Now, I guess that's a kind of great example of if your IP rules are too strong, you don't have a problem with spillovers. So, you know, people will very happily make lots of music because they'll make lots of money from it, but you'll never get an innovation like Spotify because it will always get crushed. So... I guess this comes back to what you're saying. You need you need to you need to strike the right balance between the two. I guess one interesting, if we sort of say, well, what's the current what's the current failure mode of IP rules? I suspect there's probably quite a range of IP rules that will be that would work okay. What doesn't work okay is a set of rules where there's a huge amount of opportunities for special interest lobbying and where things get very distorted. So I guess the the US Patent system is kind of notorious for this, where you've got specific jurisdictions where a lot of patent law, like the patent lawsuits, take place because they're particularly pro pro rights holder. Things like I think the East Texas court for for, for patents is seen to be like that. Similarly, in the US, you've got quite a lot of uncertainty. So you might have come across the uh, the copyright lawsuit over Pharrell Williams and Robin Thicke's song Blurred Lines. So there was a huge lawsuit where um, the estate of Marvin Gaye sued Pharrell Williams and Robin Thicke for basically creating a song that seemed very much like a song that Marvin Gaye had written. And what was really interesting about this case is that Pharrell Williams says he actually set out to create a song that was inspired by the Marvin Gaye song, but didn't breach copyright. And it turns out, you know, there is a whole industry of forensic musicologists who will advise you on whether your song breaches copyright or not. And what was interesting is in this case, the the, the case went to court. And I think it was a jury trial, weirdly. The jury just came up with a totally unexpected ruling in favour of the, the, the Marvin Gaye estate, even though everyone thought what was going on was kind of probably okay, with the result that it threw lots of the music industry is still talking about this. They're saying, oh, well, you know, in light of this trial, what are we allowed to sample? What are we allowed to be inspired by? So that's a kind of example of where a sort of you know, unexpected, quixotic interpretation rules is especially damaging. In the same way that, you know, if your business owns a factory and it were possible to repossess that factory sort of, you know, 5% of the time based on, you know, the phase of the moon or something like that, it would create a lot less invest- incentive to invest in, 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 in fixed assets. So I guess what that means, sorry, to sort of, what, what, what do you want? It probably matters less about precisely how strict the rules are as much as making sure they're clear. It also means that you probably need to, sp- that if you're a government, you need to spend quite a lot of effort resisting the efforts of either rights, seek- rights holders or lobbyists to make little exemptions and carve outs in the rules in their, f- in their favor. And having been on the other side of the table working for the government on IP policy, it's really difficult to do that. That's IP lobbyists are, you know, really smooth. They're very kind of effective, they're very highly paid. So that's a challenge. Okay, I want to move on next to inequality. Let's start with the inequality between people, right? So you you already sort of alluded to this, that, you know, where you have the right skills, the pay packets are going up, remuneration is going up. What what are the kinds of skills that are most in demand in, in an intangible economy? So most valuable. Some of them will be the skills that you that, that are probably obvious, the kind of tech skills, if 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 software and algorithms are really valuable, the ability to code, the ability to manage teams of coders, or the ability to kind of manage big scientific projects and research projects, those are kind of clearly going to be more important. But that's probably obvious. Everyone knows that. The thing that's maybe a little bit less obvious is that in a world where these spillovers really matter and where it's really important to combine synergies, the ability to bring those things together also matters a lot. And those are often kind of soft skills. They're often skills of kind of hustle and entrepreneurship, or social skills, things like the kind of famous reality distortion field that Steve Jobs was always famous for creating. 
those kind of things potentially become even more important in 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 an economy like this. The other thing that I guess is is potentially troubling about this is in a world where who owns these assets and who has the right to use them is less clear. You could be in a world where political influence or even sort of soft social influence becomes becomes more important. Whether that is kind of you know retired politicians taking on kind of high profile jobs, whether it's Instagram influencers, those kind of those sort of general soft skills probably become more financially valuable than they were 40 or 50 years ago too. Who loses out? You know, what skills are less valuable, less solicited in this new world? Well, so I guess, so one direct effect is that in some cases, these intangible assets directly relate to making some more routine jobs, even more routine than they already were. So kind of the proverbial example here is, say, working in an Amazon warehouse, where compared to a traditional warehouse job, intangible assets allow you to be more monitored. They generate a quicker work pace, which I think, you know, the, the, most people say this makes these jobs less enjoyable and less well paid than they would up, the, than they would otherwise be. So there's a kind of direct effect there. But I guess there's also an effect where if what you're saying is social status, social privilege, educational opportunities become more important, the flip side is that the, the, the pain of not having those things gets higher. So, you know, if you are more socially excluded, if you're in a place that doesn't have these kind of job opportunities, it's kind of not surprising that you will feel more left behind and that your kind of sense of social exclusion, which like, you know, there's always been kind of a divide between the big city and the kind of small town or the countryside. Um, that's always been there culturally. But the fact that cultural divide gets kind of underpinned now by an even bigger economic divide is kind of you can you can see that playing out in in our politics and our kind of society at the moment. We definitely see that sort of bifurcation of society and things like the Brexit vote, right? You know, 14, yeah. 52. Are we seeing, do you think, in a way, more losers than winners? I mean, re- relatively speaking, right? Because, you know, we don't see massive, you know, rise in unemployment. But what we do see is potentially a big um, bifurcation in the quality of the employment and the remuneration of employment. And I'm just wondering, you know, since we can see inequality is rising, is that because, you know, there are increasingly a small number of winners, if you like, or big winners? And then the overall population is, is tending downwards in a way, right? In terms of, you know, real income. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 always hard to say what the you know what what the real what what's ultimately driving inequality because you know you can always even if you have an employment system that's creating a lot of inequality, you can always tax, you can always redistribute to generate kind of more equality afterwards. I guess the kind of an optimistic way of looking at this is that this intangible economy, as well as generating some of these kind of superstar jobs that are really prestigious and really highly paid, it also generates a lot of jobs that are potentially more satisfying, more fulfilling for people to do than than, than your kind of traditional job 50 years ago, even if they're even if they're not as highly paid. So, you know, there's a lot of jobs in the creative industries where that are not particularly highly paid, but all the research that's been done on well-being suggests that people actually like doing these jobs much more than than kind of potentially some jobs in in say traditional manufacturing. So that I wouldn't be totally pessimistic, but it's definitely something that we we need to be aware of where this this kind of bifurcation between 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 these elite jobs and a kind of more socially excluded mass. What do we do about inequality in this way? Because it, because yeah, you, you said we have, a, a, I suppose, a small number of superstar firms, a small number of superstar individuals earning. I don't know if this is could be could be used for you know sort of excess rent, if you like, or whatever you know excess returns on their skills or excess. Is is the answer to tax that and redistribute it, or or is that you know is that a sort of you know an industrial age policy idea that doesn't hold so well in the in digital age? I, th- I don't think we should give up on tax and redistribution yet. I think that is that is <laughs> yeah. that is that is pretty important and is still worth doing. And you know, for all that people talk about international tax avoiding companies, I think there's still quite a lot of low hanging fruit there. In a country like the UK, you can just employ more tax inspectors, and and uh, you know, we we kind of underinvest that. There is probably low hanging fruit in just basic compliance. So we shouldn't give we shouldn't use the intangible economy as an excuse to give up on doing just the basic stuff to make society fairer. I guess the flips, the, what, what you then get is, I think there are then some interesting angles where aspects of the intangible economy, we 
maybe exacerbate sort of unexpected problems of inequality. So one thing that there's been a ton of research on looks at the cities that do really well out of the intangible economy. Both There's been research on this both in the US and in the UK. And one thing that's really interesting, if you take sort of the Bay Area, Northern California, great example of a place that's been very successful because of intangible assets, not just computers, but even before that. And what the research shows is that once upon a time, it was pretty, housing in and around the Bay Area was pretty cheap. It was easy to build more housing when you needed to, and therefore the cost of renting or buying a house nearby was kind of somewhat affordable. And what that meant is if you had people making a lot of money in, say, San Francisco, that that money that wealth somewhat, somehow got spread around because it was easy to move from a poorer part of the US to San Francisco, even if you didn't have high skills. And you could take a job and you could take a, you could take a low skill job, but because you're in a place where there were lots of people making a lot of money, you would get a pretty high wage relative to what you would have got had you stayed where you were. And what people like Enrico Moretti, an economist um, who looks at these things have documented, is that that's kind of changed because it's become much, much harder to build new houses in places like San Francisco. It's definitely true in the southeast of England as well. And what that basically creates, that creates a really hidden sort of unfairness. Because if you grow up in a kind of place where there aren't a lot of great jobs, and for whatever reason, you're lucky enough to have a good education, to have the skills where you can take advantage of the intangible economy, you probably have a high enough salary to make it worthwhile moving to London or San Francisco. You can afford the crazy rents. Your landlord will suck up a lot of the money, but you know it just about makes sense and you can grow there. But if you aren't in that position, you're stuck where you are. So the old world where, I mean, it's very unfashionable to talk about money trickling down or trickling out. In the old economy, it did that much more than it did now. And the real barrier, one of the real barriers was was rents. So I guess what this what this means is, one of the ways of tackling inequality in an intangible economy, surprisingly, is through a very tangible asset. It's through housing. It basically means that making it easier to build housing, making it cheaper for people to to move to places that they want to move in, becomes even more important. Yeah. So I guess you can't have social mobility without geographical mobility, or it's much harder. Well, it's interesting. I mean, there was a the, you know a very sort of widely talked about book a few years ago by David Goodhart, who talked about the idea that the world was divided into somewheres and anywheres. And the anywheres were the kind of metro lib elite who kind of went from New York to London and just kind of didn't care. And the somewheres were kind of rooted in Pittsburgh or Grimsby or wherever and kind of loved their city. But I think there's another way of looking at that, which basically says we've created a world, you know, it's it's not that people who David calls somewheres are unusually in love with one place and hate moving. It's that we've made it so that even if they want to move, they can't afford to. So that mobility has become something that only the very privileged who are going into these 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 high paying jobs can can ever hope to do. And um, in a world where a lot of this intangible ha- economy is happening in particular places, that is a really that's that's a very damaging burden to inflict on 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 a country. Yeah, and I think there might you probably have great statistics on this, but it's, it seems to me that also that the intangible economy maybe doesn't throw up as many jobs as the as the tangible economy. And a lot of the job growth is in sort of what we might call proximity jobs. Mm. And therefore, we're sort of holding back the growth of those types of jobs by, again, not allowing too much it, it, geographical mobility. Yeah, no, no, you're totally right. It's becoming more and more difficult for traditional lenders, you know, universal banks, corporate banks, to lend to corporates, because it's really difficult for them to get enough comfort over that kind of loan where it's made in the absence of, of collateral, you know, physical assets that a company can pledge to the bank in order to, to secure that loan. So, and I think again, it's, there's another brilliant graphic in the book where you show that, you know, despite everything we talked about, the growth of intangible, intangible assets versus tangible assets, actually the lending has gone up against tangible assets versus intangible assets, which just seems perverse, right? So is that is that at the root of it, this this absence of collateral? Yeah, that's that's that that's that's right. So I mean it's been called the the, the curse of collateral, the fact that banks want ideally they want assets that they can they can take a charge over if a business fails. That is the way debt finance works. And most businesses in the economy rely on debt finance. Most financial institutions provide debt finance. You know, for all that we talk about the stock market or venture capital, those are modes of finance that apply to a very, very small minority of, 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 of businesses. 
So there's a kind of real challenge here. On the one hand, how do you develop the institutions to provide more equity-based finance to a greater range of businesses? And also, how do you make a rule system that doesn't discriminate against that? Because obviously, first rule of financial uh, structuring for a business is that debt interest is tax deductible, but payments to shareholders are not. So yeah. what else equal, you'd want to finance a business with debt. So, okay, so this, there's a lot to unpack. So the first question is, you know, should we change that? Should debt not be tax deductible? So the, the kind of wonkish answer, the ideal world answer is, 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 yeah, you want to change that. You want a world where debt finance and equity finance are placed on the same footing. And as I said, this is quite wonkish. This is something where economists and tax policy wonks have come up with a million and one proposals for, for, for exactly how you do this, involving things like equity tax credits. The problem is this is this politically would be a really hard thing to do. I mean, if you were to move to, if you were to try and change the economy like this, you know, you'd immediately have the private equity industry up in arms. Uh, you would create a lot of challenges for the banking system. It would be a big change. So you've got to think not just about what's the ideal end state, but also what's the institutional basis for it, and how do you get there without totally blowing up lots of, causing lots of unintended harm to the economy. Exactly, because you can't form policy in a vacuum away from all the sort of path dependencies. But maybe maybe a better question might be then, how do we get sort of more VC type capital um, flowing to the economy? So I think that's a really that's that's a really good question. Germany is an interesting example here because if you look at the way German banks do business lending, they very often will take equity warrants in small businesses, which is effectively like a way of making your debt finance more equity like. And one of the effects of that is if you look at, say, a British small business lender, you know, a British high street bank making a loan to a small business, almost invariably they will look to take a charge on the owner's or director's house. And that is predicated on the idea that the owner that the, the, the owners own their own house, which is obviously quite an assumption anyway. So it kind of skews you towards lending to a certain type of person. Now that's basically a way of getting tangible tangible collateral in a business that's mostly intangible because a house is kind of pretty pretty tangible. Now in Germany probably partly because home ownership rates have always historically been much lower, more people rent in Germany, banks have kind of had to find a way around that. So these equity warrants is something that they've always done. Now, it means the banks do end up doing more due diligence into the businesses because you need to understand more about how the businesses work. But I guess they figure that's what that's a worthwhile cost because the upside of these equity warrants is quite high. So I guess that's one example of it being done well. I mean, if you look on the fringes of the venture capital sector, it's really interesting to see different types of more kind of growth oriented venture capital branching into 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 more markets and you know people like Vitruvian I think are really interesting from that point of view so I think we'll see a gradual a gradual growth there but this is this is really hard this is a kind of 10 year a 10 year project and will probably require kind of governments to get behind it too now a lot of these sort of intangible businesses have become a bit more a bit better understood and you know, so you see people lending, for for example, putting debt into businesses that have SaaS revenues, or you see people putting debt into businesses where they understand the mechanics of a game, for example. You know, they know at the point at which a game is going to get large pickup, and they're happy to invest to allow that the games provided to invest in paid advertising on, on Facebook or whatever. So I think people ask, you know, I think maybe the the idea that debt debt no longer works is 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 perhaps too simplistic, and maybe just debt needs an upgrade, or the people that yeah. You know, that's, that's definitely true, and I guess obviously, you know, anyone as anyone involved in debt markets will, will know. You know, you some lending is against collateral, but actually, you know, a ton of debt is lent against cash flows and expectations of cash flows. So, but I guess to your point, what that does require is a greater understanding of what those cash flows look like, and it kind of again, this is another of these things where where it kind of it advantages the smart money. If you can understand, if you can understand these streams of cash flows and get enough certainty to be able to lend against them, then kind of knowledge is knowledge is unusually valuable. Something that's only sort of really occurred to me lately since you know since I started a business, right? Which is, you know, if 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 I you know invest capital on the stock market, you know, this may this may vary jurisdiction to jurisdiction, right? But I face a sort of capital gains tax of X, right? And that, that capital gains tax is the same as if I take a much more risky stance of investing in a business that creates employment, it generates intangible assets with spillovers and all those things. So do, do you think we need a sort of separate treatment 
of cap of people depending on where the gains from capital come from. That's really interesting. I guess you know we've we've got some kind of limited examples of that already. You know, there are some tax breaks for for providing risk capital either in the UK, things like the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme, Venture Capital Trusts, and so forth. So the kind of principle is there already. But it's a really interesting question. I think broadly speaking, you know, ways of if these spillovers are good, then ways of subsidizing those, whether that's through direct funding or tax breaks or tax breaks for capital, that you know, it seems like there's a good, there's a strong economic case for that. And then the, the, the last question I want to ask you in this section was really around the role of government here, because there's, if you, you've probably seen it, you know that the, there's Mariana Mazzucato, yeah. her diagram where she said just all of the, sort of, the, 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 the sort of constituents of the iPhone and how many of them were, were spillovers from government fundamental research. And I'm just wondering, you know, because it's become, there's been, sort of, I would say, a, a reduction in, in government fundamental research in a lot of countries, right? Because, you know, there was there was this sort of ideology of, you know, p- that crowding out public private sector investment and so on. But do you, do you think we should maybe shift the balance there in the debate and push more money towards fundamental research? I think there's definitely a really strong argument for saying government should be funding more things like R&D because they have these spillovers. If you just leave it up to business, you will get less of that than you would otherwise get because businesses can't be sure they will internalize the benefits. And I think one of the really important things that kind of Mariana's book kind of, um, it really made the case for that in a kind of very powerful way, which is really important. I think there's a lot of questions on how you do that, what the best way of, of, of doing that is, and particularly doing it in a way so that businesses also invest alongside. Because obviously, the, what, what wasn't told in that story of the iPhone is it alongside lots of fundamental research, there was also a ton of often quite unrewarding R&D done by businesses, whether yeah, it's kind yeah. of giant magneto resistance, which is how you got the kind of hard disks that, you, that, that, that these devices rely on, to the actual turning of these things into useful kind of consumer-friendly products. All of that requires a lot of investment as well, which often has quite high spillovers. Um, so public investment, yes, we absolutely need more of it. And it's quite welcome that a lot of governments, I think, are moving in that direction. It also becomes even more important to work out how you make that mesh well with what businesses want to do. So many people talk about this sort of K-shaped economy, right, where everything that was sort of analog is, you know, it's really suffering and everything that was digital or intangible is, is kind of accelerating. And I'm just wondering, is, is that too simplistic a read of the situation? So I wanted to start with, you know, how intangible assets fare during lockdown, for example, because I read a piece that you wrote on Medium where you sort of, you know, you made the somewhat counterintuitive argument that actually intangibles might not be intangible assets might not be faring as well as you might think uh, during a lockdown. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, I think the the pandemic was, it was very interesting from the point of view of what it said for the intangible and the tangible economy, because when it started out, I think there was a huge focus on whether we've got our kind of tangible asset response right, the way I would describe it. So people were sort of saying, you know, can we build enough hospitals? Do we have enough ventilators? Do we have enough factories making personal protective equipment? And, you know, everyone was very impressed when in Wuhan, they built this huge new hospital and we were saying, you know, would the UK be able to cope, would the US be able to cope? And then those countries, we do, you know, we built the Nightingale hospitals. So everyone said, phew, this is great. Wow. So this was all about tangible assets, you know, physical things. And I think what people kind of rapidly realized is that actually that wasn't the real challenge and it wasn't the thing that, 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 that people struggled with. Because actually, what people came to realize was really important was what you could call intangible assets. So, first and foremost, it was can we develop vaccines that are effective and can we put in place the supply chains to get them out there? Both classic intangible asset problems. Can we put in place test and trace systems? And test and trace systems, you know, they're made up of software, they're made up of processes, um, they're made up of data. You know, those was, those were classic examples of intangible assets. And some countries did them really well, and some countries did them maybe not so well. And I think if you look at the differential mortality rates in different countries, it was in some ways the intangible response that really, really made the explain the, the bigger gaps much more than that much more than the the, the the tangible assets. So I think that was kind of one really one interesting aspect how 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 the, how the focus changed. I guess another really interesting question here is what the move on many people's part to remote working has done. So certainly in the UK, the latest statistics, 35% of people 
are now working entirely remotely. The historical figures for that before the pandemic struck have been like less than 5%. So that's a really big change. And of the people, of the 65% who are not wholly working remotely, a fair chunk of those people are doing some are doing some remote work. So although this isn't the majority of the population, it's a really big chunk of people. It's a really big change. And what happens to spillovers, do you think, in the world of remote work? Because... You know, I think, again, in the, it was in the same article, which I very much uh, recommend to people, it's on, it's on Medium, which is you talk about how during Prohibition you had, you know, you could trace a reduction in the number of patents because because people need to meet in bars if they to come up with so really brilliant creative ideas. And, and I think there's some element of that, which is, you know, even though, you know, ostensibly we're, we're still interacting with our colleagues in a very sort of collaborative manner. It's different, right? It's different if you're remote and you can't go for a beer or, or, or coffee or whatever to, and have those sort of brainstorming moments, those moments of, of serendipity. Is your hunch that this is going to lead to fewer spillovers? So I think this is the $64,000 question. It's yeah, okay, yeah. We, so no one really knows. And I think to some extent, it's probably up for grabs. It's almost certainly true that it's going to have some effect on, on, on spillovers because you're not getting these kind of, as you say, these casual interactions that maybe some ideas depended on. The question is, you know, can you, to what extent can we replicate them? To what extent maybe can a lot of remote working work well? And to what extent can we come up with ways of doing remote working that, that, that kind of give you just enough of what you need? I mean, there was that famous saying where, who, who was it who said, you know, I'm 50% of my advertising works. I just don't know which. Oh, yeah. Percent. It's probably <laughs> yeah. the same where you kind of think, well, you know, there is probably some really important part of the time you spend in and around the office with people, but it might actually only be 10% of that time. And the question is, can you work out what that is and, 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 and focus on that more effectively? So I think that's, there's a, if we can do that, there's a huge benefit because remote working is incredibly good for productivity, but you know, it's a, a big forced experiment. Well, I think the thing is the experiment's going on for a very long time now. So I'm sure people are starting to codify some of those things that, you know, there's moments of serendipity and, and putting them into the way that we do remote working. Because, it, you know, if in the beginning of the pandemic, it was very much kind of everything just moved to Zoom. And now I think people are realizing, for example, that, you know, you know, it's just doing things synchronously through through Zoom is not great. And, you know, and, 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 you know, Slack sometimes can be a better medium, for example. I think people are sort of now adapting the way they do remote working, right? I think that's totally true. And it's interesting, you know, there are some bits, that there are some industries that have been doing this for longer. So, you know, yeah. huge parts of the tech industry have been very comfortable with aspects of remote working and having remote development teams, as you say, using asynchronous communication, and text communication much more than, than than video conferencing. And I guess the real question is, can we work out the lessons for that and can we scale them up quickly? Because that could be really valuable. You started to talk about San Francisco earlier on, and I had to hold myself back from delving into that. But so we on a, on a, a few podcasts ago, we had Ian Hathaway on, and he was talking about his idea that, you know, more and more smaller cities, if you like, or smaller conurbations can, can learn from San Francisco and to some extent, you know, replicate the playbook and i'm just wondering does that now that sort of diffusion of the magic of of silicon valley happen faster now because maybe it makes less or it's less important than it was to be in physical proximity yeah i think i think i think this is a real opportunity for anywhere that wants to compete with silicon valley to make to make the most of it partly because it's about getting new norms in place that will help these areas. So if, you, if we can get more comfortable with remote hiring, if we can get more comfortable with remote VC funding, something that's often driven the proximity, then that then you know this is a sort of an opportunity, as you say, there's a kind of two-year window where some of these new practices could get could get entrenched and people could realize their work. That's a that's a huge opportunity to make a kind of step change. I mean I guess the other dimension is that if we think about, you know, talking about San Francisco, San Francisco is kind of an interesting story. So, you know, I worked in Silicon Valley at the beginning of the, 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 the 2000s. And San Francisco wasn't really a part of the Silicon Valley ecosystem back then. The idea that, you know, this, that this one big city is kind of the epicenter of tech is, as far as I can see, kind of something that it's the kind of last decade phenomenon. Silicon Valley for a very long time was just kind of the suburbs and Palo Alto and Mountain View and Cupertino and places like that. And so there's kind of an interesting question. Well, you know, maybe the, maybe 
the move to really core cities that maybe maybe that might maybe we might take a step back from from that so i definitely think there's a lot to play for you know if you're a city leader or you're someone who wants to kind of build a cluster somewhere other than san francisco or new york or london then this might be a big opportunity for you one of the things i thought was interesting in that article you wrote is you said that you know, a, t- a tangible asset during lockdown doesn't you doesn't get used right and therefore you know it's it's sort of the productive capacity of the asset is kind of frozen and then once you know things go back to normal whatever that normal looks like then you know it, it then becomes productive again whereas what you said about some of the intangible assets is they degrade much faster in the absence of of being used right and I just, and again, it was something that I thought was quite interesting because I think there's been this sort of assumption that everything intangible is is benefiting and everything intangible, you know, you wouldn't want to be an airline. And it was just a more nuanced kind of view of, of tangible versus intangible assets. Yeah, you're right. I mean, this there's this quite kind of question we were thinking about, well, what's the cost of, what's the economic cost of leaving, leaving an asset, a business unused for a while and we were speculating that maybe for a very physically intensive business that cost was lower so it was easier to kind of mothball a factory and turn it and turn it back on again than it is to mothball an advertising agency and turn it back on again but that's very speculative and i think that's something that that's something i don't think anyone knows the answer to that so there's lots of real-time economic puzzles kind of going on right now okay and this is the only sort of political question i will ask it which is do you think that the pandemic is kind of giving a backdrop or, or a unique set of circumstances in which somebody like Joe Biden could introduce, you know, a, a massive set of policy initiatives, a, you know, a new deal, if you like. And because because uh, one of the themes that we talked about is every sort of policy initiative we've talked about, we've talked about some really difficult politics around it, right? You know, so, you know, for example, you know, opening up planning restrictions, I'd imagine is a very difficult political thing. Changing the tax relief on debt would be a very difficult thing politically to introduce. So does it give, you know, the pretext for sort of more ambitious political maneuvers? So I think there it definitely there is definitely the need, you know, there is a platform of policies that would be really great to put in place, whether that's more investment in R and D, planning reform, making sure that we kind of create the opportunity for people to, to to take on these new jobs, investment in education. There's definitely a need for that. I think the kind of the the, the real the really difficult thing is that in an age of populism, all these things get harder to do. So I talked earlier about how when we were talking about competition policy, that really actually what you need is you know more bureaucrats, more pen pushers and to give them more power. Now, that is a pretty hard sell in the age of QAnon and um, you know rampant populism in, mo- in most countries. So you have this kind of weird situation that the, 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 the need for this kind of institutional reform is greatest at a time when the political dynamics push you in the opposite direction. You know, if you want to sort of say, let's let's spend more money on R&D because that will lead to good business opportunities and create economic growth and more jobs. What does it mean when you say invest more in R&D? It means you're going to tax people more and you're going to pay that money to kind of liberal elite scientists. Yeah. That's the kind of paradox. And I think it's really interesting to see different people trying to negotiate that in in in, in different ways. And you don't think that the pandemic gives kind of enough political capital to, to f- you know, for once to unlock the paradox. So you think it's just, it's not as simple as that. It might do. You're right. You're, you're totally right. Maybe the pandemic will give the opportunity to, to do this. And maybe it's the kind of thing where even if you can't do the big push, you can get some of the way there. And that will, yeah. that, that, that will still, that will still make a difference. It's, it's definitely tricky because the politics and the policy push in opposite directions. Would you mind telling us or sharing with us one of your favorite books? A really interesting book I read recently is a book called The Hungry Empire by Lizzie Collingham. And it's, it's what's fascinating about it, it's basically a book about the history of the British Empire seen through the history of food. And what's so interesting about this, it obviously speaks to a lot of issues around global history around race, around the relationship between Britain and the rest of the world, all of which is super topical at the moment. But it does it through a prism that I think will be really interesting to anyone who's interested in technology, in kind of economics, in the kind of the business of how the world works. It's a long way from technology, but in some ways it's a book that's very much about technology and a lot of the issues in the world today. So 
gets a strong recommendation from me. Okay, I'm going to read that, and we'll share for the for the listeners. We'll share the links to all of these in on our website. So, uh, next one, a favorite recent article for me. I think the the something I I would absolutely recommend here is the work of Enrico Moretti on cities, and we talked a bit about it earlier, but. Um, he wrote a great book called The New Geography of Jobs and a few articles based off that, where what he looked at was the way that we live in a world where great cities, dynamic cities are increasingly economically important. But one of the problems that we have is that the ability to live there, to afford to pay the rent there and move there is unequally distributed because we make it harder and harder to build in these cities. And he effectively made the case that you know, it's totally kind of countercultural in an age where we like to talk about somewheres and anywheres. But he talked about the fact that actually what lies at the heart of our problem is the fact we've made it harder to move. And this is not something that people actually want. And it's not something that makes people happy. So to me, that's a kind of very important and topical, um, topical article right now. And then uh, next one is a favorite. Uh, I hesitate to use well, the word influencer, just or, or like a you know, favorite thinker, somebody whose essays and articles you regularly turn to. And this may be, I, I don't know if all of the people you have on say this, but I am, I'm, I'm addicted to the blogger Scott Alexander, who used to write Slate Star Codex. He's now gone onto Substack and his, 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 the new version is called Astral Codex 10. Um, he's a, you may know, he's a US-based psychiatrist. He's kind of very involved in the rationalist community. But he writes about technology, about economics, about um, psychology about kind of almost anything. He has a kind of an absolutely incredible writing style. Everything he writes is an absolute breeze, but he does it with a kind of an incredible kind of good nature. So strong, a strong recommend from me. But this is exactly why we asked these questions because I, I confess to not knowing uh, Scott Alexander. So I'm gonna, oh, amazing. Um, so I'm gonna take okay. Uh, next one, a productivity hack, something that um, enables you to, to operate at scale in the intangible economy. <laughs> My this is this is a very weak productivity hack because I'm I'm very bad at it, but I do try and do ten minutes of mindfulness meditation at the beginning of every day, and I'm probably the worst meditator in 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 the world. But either because of some kind of placebo effect or because it's useful, it does make me feel like a little bit more on top of things. Okay, and then the last question is a favorite brand. My surprise favorite brand is I think it would have to be Bovril. I, I I I rely on Bovril for my protein needs. It keeps me going in home working. I kind of always have a mug of it on the go. It's a, uh, a, a kind of remarkably nutritious food, and it's got a kind of retro appeal in the sense that it's something that was um, was was very big a hundred years ago, but has kind of come back into popularity in an age of high protein, low carb eating. Yeah, and I think it's something that's um, quite polarizing, right? So it's good. It's good that you've taken a sort of you know slightly <laughs> controversial position there. That's good. <laughs> I'd like to think so. I guess many people that listen to this will not know what Bovril is, so that's it'd be interesting to see the googling. Uh, Bovril and... <laughs> yeah, very very affordable, Matt, but very accessible product as well. Great, uh, Steve. This has been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing your insights around this structural shift from the tangible to the intangible economy. Thanks so much, Ben. It's been a real pleasure talking to you about it. Thank you for listening to Structural Shifts by Aperture. To learn more about us, visit aperture.co. We are strategy for the networked age. Until next time.